I'm going to talk to you today uh, about leadership. So who is the leader? What is leadership? What team do you belong to? Who are your teammates? What is collective uh, responsibility and opportunity? And so we are the leaders, you are the leader. So when I was 15, I had a dream, and that dream was to play netball for New Zealand. Um, where did that dream come from? Why did I have that dream? I uh, was born in a place called Taupo. Uh, it's in a rural community, and I'm the eldest of four children. Uh, growing up, my parents said to me that I could do anything and be anything. My father also said to me when I asked him, Dad, what's the difference between a man and a woman? He looked at me straight-faced and he said, a man is ball-bearing and a woman is child-bearing. There is no difference. <laughs> I actually think that was an incredibly profound thing for my father to say, because what he said to me was that my gender was irrelevant, that actually I could have these dreams and aspirations and I could fulfil them, and that fundamentally he loved me unconditionally. So when I had this dream to become a silver fern at the age of uh, 15, uh, where did that come from? Where did that passion, where did that, where did that desire come from? And again, it came from my parents. Both my mum and dad played sport, but particularly with my father. He was obsessed about the All Blacks. So no matter where they were playing, three o'clock in the morning, whatever it would be, the house lights would be turned on, uh, we'd be making toasties in the fireplace, and we would watch the rugby. So I guess his obsession was transferred to me. When I look at politics and my passion and desire to be a politician, again, I look to my father. My father was the chair of our local marae committee to the day he died. He was the chair of our local primary school, way beyond his four children leaving. Uh, so my father instilled in me a sense of collectivism, social responsibility, uh, taking leadership opportunities in the community. So when I decided I wanted to be the Silver Fern, uh, what did that look like? Uh, for me, it was shooting goals at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, it was uh, getting out of bed at 5 o'clock in the morning because I wanted to do some practice. And I remember my father telling me to get to bed. Um, and I remember in 1987, New Zealand was playing in the World Cup, Cup in, in Glasgow. And I taped these games and I watched these games and I'd watch the same game seven times because every time I'd watch, I'd watch Margaret Forsyth, who was playing goal attack. She was my kind of hero. I'd watch Margaret Martinger, who was playing goal shoot. I'd watch Lynn Parker, who was playing centre. And so I was completely obsessed and would watch the same quarter but watch different players. I mean, that's what motivation looks like. And you can't manufacture it. It comes from a sense of desire, hunger from within you. And when I think about my work as a politician, where does that come from? What does that look like? Uh, for me, it's actually about engaging in my community. It's about understanding my constituents. It's about having relationships that are ongoing not just an election year, wanting to go and meet people and be seen at different events. Actually, it means already planning for a Christmas event that we had for the first time in Manurewa last year. And so a group of us are already getting together to make sure that children and families in our community who haven't got the means to have a, a collective Christmas, they don't have family, we're already planning our next Christmas uh, event. Now, this is an interesting slide because what it essentially says is that potential and talent opens lots of doors. And so when I was 15 and I had my dream, um, I achieved it when I was 17. I actually didn't really know how to play netball. I just had a lot of natural talent, a lot of potential, and people believed in me. And fundamentally, the people who believed in me were my parents, but they were also different coaches at different points in my career who saw something in me, who saw that I had this spark, this hunger, this desire. And so they gave me opportunities. Um, netball uh, was my passion. 
Um, and I played in the New Zealand netball team for four years. So I was 17, and when I was 21, something happened. Um, it's only recently, actually, that I've really thought about what happened. Because one day we had a game, and I just didn't want to go. And I turned up late, and I had to talk to the coach, Tracy Fear, after the game. And she said to me, Why, what happened? Why were you late? And I just said, basically, I don't think I like netball anymore. <laughs> um, that year, I'd also started playing rugby. And so um, one of my teammates, who had kind of pressured me for a long time to go and play, uh, got me involved in rugby. But when I think about it now, the reason I lost my motivation and passion in netball is because I couldn't be me. I was actually coming out, and I had nobody uh, to talk to about it. And netball wasn't friendly. Netball was actually really homophobic. And so I went to rugby because, guess what? There were lesbians in rugby. I didn't know I was a lesbian, but there were lesbians in rugby. And so I ended up transferring all my passion and motivation into another context. So I'd only been playing rugby for three months, and then I became a black fern. So <laughs> I guess what I've learned in life, too, is that one door closes, another opens. You just have to move with it. Uh, but when I think about it now, actually, it's incredibly sad that as a 21-year-old, I left something that I, that I loved uh, because of homophobia. Um, my political career has been really interesting. Um, because I actually first stood uh, when I was 27. Um, I got into Parliament when I was 36. It took me nine years. And so uh, having that dream and aspiration in politics, I've actually uh, ended up having a very different trajectory uh, to my sporting career. My sporting career was really easy. My political career has been really hard, and it's taken a lot of hard work and effort and persistence. Uh, and a lot of that is around some of the structures that our political parties have and how they're less than embracing of women. Uh, but more about that later. Um, all I do want to say, I got in initially as a List MP in 2008. I stand proudly now as the MP for Manurewa, and it is the people of Manurewa who vote me in and ensure that I continue to be an MP. Now, this is a really interesting quote. Practice does not make perfect, only perfect practice makes perfect. Uh, what does that mean? Actually, for me, in the sporting sense, it actually was about specific preparation of the body. Um, we had access to all the experts in the world. So I was fit, I was fast, and I was powerful. And I did what my coaches said I had to do. We had standards, and I could meet all, this, all the standards. Um, in terms of my mind, pre preparing my mind, what did that mean? It meant I knew the game plan, I knew my role and responsibility, and I could execute the game plan. And I think where I got to spiritually, actually, because I prepared so much, um, I was really calm. I remember going to games, uh, World Cup final, actually, for rugby, and I'd be yawning in the bus, yawning in the, um, in the changing room, but it was because I was so relaxed. And so I got to a point in my career, a point in my life, where I'd, I guess I knew I'd done all the hard work and I could just relax. And when the whistle went, then I was into it. Um, politics is really interesting because um, I've had a bit of a transformation over the last few months. Uh, it's incredibly stressful. And some of the ways we deal with that stress is really bad. So uh, what I've got now is this Fitbit that my sister gave him to me at Christmas. And I make sure that I do my, well, it's averaging about 16,000 steps. Um, I don't drink alcohol very much. Um, I don't eat bread and wheat, um, and I fast once, once a week, one day a week. So for me to be sharp in the political space, I have to be healthy. To have a sharp mind, you need a, a sharp body. Uh, and my, I guess, preparation in the political sense uh, is very much a functional uh, responsibility to attend all the regional conferences, uh, to be au okay fait with what hap what's happening in the party, and to, um, yeah, just to contribute in every aspect of um, the party's uh, activities in terms of our engagement with the public. It's your responsibility and your uh, opportunity is really interesting. Um, when I uh, played rugby and the ball was kicked off, 
I would want the ball. I would dream about catching the ball, taking the ball, running through everybody, doing a bit of a John Q uh, moment in time and scoring under the, under the posts. Um, so I was really hungry. And I think that um, when you're prepared, then you are hungry because you want to contribute and you want to be successful uh, and you want to be part of a winning team. And so for me, uh, hunger was an essential element uh, of my sporting life. Um, what does that hunger look like in politics? Because it's easy. I mean, you can understand uh, within a, a sports context that you're part of a team. I mean, I obviously couldn't get the ball and score a try, but my job was to, to catch the ball, move us forward. It's all about momentum, um, pass the ball to somebody else, or at least ensure uh, that we had a quick transition so that always we were going forward. Um, for me, what the ball looks like uh, is actually about advocacy and the base of advocacy that I have in the work that I, that I do. That base of advocacy is around uh, my constituents in Manurewa. That base of advocacy is around the communities that I represent and serve. And that base of advocacy is also around the groups that I identify with as a woman. So I co-chair um, the cross-party working group in Parliament as a proud member of the LGBTI community. I'm on that cross-party group. As an Indigenous woman, I'm proud to be Māori. And so um, I very much um, practice in the political space from what I call team equality. So team equality uh, is what I take uh, responsibility uh, and look at opportunities within that space always to address and advance our cause. So outcomes. Where I got to in my uh, political life uh, was that I took responsibility for the outcome. Can I have some water, please? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. What did that mean? What do I mean by that? So I knew I'd done the work. Um, I wasn't afraid of beep tests, I wasn't afraid of strength tests, I wasn't afraid um, to show my teammates, my coaches, that I'd done the work. So I got to a point, particularly in my rugby career, where I took responsibility for my selection. So I didn't get selected, I picked myself. You know, and I was very process focused. So when you become part of the space of taking full responsibility, you end up situating the power within you. You don't give it to somebody else. You don't say that the coach has got power over me or that selector has got power over me. I have power over me. So I choose whether or not I made the black ferns. Um, in the political space, what this represents to me actually is about your integrity. Um, it's about your the mutual respect that you have for the leaders, the people that you're working in the community who are doing the hard yards in our schools, in our churches, in our businesses, in our social organisations. And so fundamentally it's about the relationships you have with people uh, and the responsibilities that you have to one another, I guess to support what everybody is trying to achieve. Are you ready for it? Uh, this is very much about recognising when opportunities present. And are you ready, are you prepared uh, to take the opportunities? And so, again, in the sporting field, it was easy because I was hungry, I wanted the ball. Um, but what does that actually look like uh, in a political sphere? And um, for me and New Zealand, I think that was marriage equality. Like, when I think through... Uh, what happened in terms of the bill in the last term, which was my first full t term as an MP, I believe New Zealand was ready for marriage equality. Our LGBTI communities were ready for marriage equality. And when you look at our history, we did homosexual law reform in 1986, and in fact next year is 30 years since homosexual law reform. We had um, included sexual orientation in the Human Rights Act in 1993. We had civil unions in 2004. So I believe New Zealand was ready. Our communities were ready. And actually, young people were ready because we saw for the first time engagement with young people at secondary school. We had 21,532 submissions uh, to the Marriage Amendment Bill. And so we were ready. And we were ready because 
uh, Barack Obama, in my opinion, actually provided that opportunity. It was a defining presidential election issue in 2012, and we kind of just seized the opportunity. I was asked to write a blog post, um, and I'll talk a little bit more in the next slide about, um, because I could, I did. So I was an MP. Um, after the 2011 general election, I was um, given the responsibility of chairing Labor's Rainbow Caucus, and part of that was our commitment and our policy to equality under the law for all in relationships. Um, I took the responsibility to lead marriage equality uh, as part of the team that I was part of, and um, I had a bill in the ballot uh, in the same month that Barack Obama uh, came out in support of marriage equality. Uh, within two months, that bill had been drawn. I mean, inc incredible. Some people have been in Parliament for over 20 years and never had a bill pulled in the ballot. My bill was pulled after in the second draw, and when I was asked about it, I just said the rainbow gods are smiling down on us. Uh, but it was also an opportunity for us to be part of a, a global conversation. So I love Nelson Mandela. He's one of my heroes. I've got his image on my wall, uh, and I've also got Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream image on my wall. And so for me, our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. And so this fundamentally goes back to my first slide. What is a leader? And I think a lot of people are afraid to be the leader because of the formality of it, because you have to be the one who gets up front, you have to be the one who speaks, uh, you've got all the responsibility for leading something. Um, but I, what I realised through the marriage equality campaign is that actually there were lots of leaders. I wasn't the only leader. Kevin Haig was one of the leaders. Tohenaria was one of the leaders. Uh, a lot of the leaders from um, homosexual law reform were the leaders. Our young people were the leaders. They were the ones engaging and talking about how relevant marriage equality uh, is to us as a country and was to them specifically in their families. So I guess my critical message um, is that when you take leadership uh, opportunities, when you want to catch the ball, actually you're not alone. We think we're alone, but actually we're not. And I think when you look at the latest campaign, actually, that Marianne ran around child poverty, over 15,000 people, it might be a lot more now, signed a petition. And why did they sign that petition? What motivated their action to get engaged and to do that? And I think, fundamentally, it's because we're all part of Team New Zealand, in its purest sense. We actually care about each other, and we want to be part of a community that is socially responsible, that does want to engage, that does want to address the issues. Because not to means that, actually, we don't care. It's someone else's problem. I'm going to live my life. I'm just going to be blind to uh, what's happening in our society. And I fundamentally believe that that's not who we are and our natural reactions. So I think we are powerful beyond measure. I think that um, our biggest challenge is finding our teammates. And so once you find your teammates, then at some point in that relationship, everybody has an opportunity uh, to be the leader. So we are the leader. You are the leader. Don't be afraid to catch the ball. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Kia ora.